Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, Zenko uh, live uh, interview. Uh, today uh, we're going to talk about cloud media workflows. So I'm Giorgio Reni, I'm the CTO of Skeleti, and I'm uh, joined with uh, some of our colleagues who are going to talk about this uh, workflow. So Wally uh, McDermott is our VP of Cloud Business uh, and Paul, our Chief Product Officer. And today we'll start with uh, a presentation from Wally about uh, this uh, media need and the use case to use the cloud for video. And then we'll uh, make it a panel discussion about uh, how Zenko can help and what are the uh, uh, difficulties in this uh, industry that the cloud can uh, help resolve. Perfect. Shall I kick it off then, Giorgio? Yes, go ahead. Terrific. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Uh, as Giorgio mentioned, I'll spend maybe five, ten minutes max just giving an overview of how uh, the media and entertainment industry, I think, is being revolutionized um, by the fourth industrial revolution, and then we'll have a panel discussion. So those of you who are familiar with media and entertainment uh, probably will recognize many of the bullet points on this slide. Um, the industry is being disrupted. Uh, from, from the increase of data, just the sheer amount of data, as well as the changes in the data format and types. I mean, think about how we all watched a television screen or videos 20 or 25, 30 years ago. We sat in front of one screen that was usually in our living room, looked a little bit like a small refrigerator, um, and the media and entertainment companies who sent content to us um, really sort of dictated what we watched and when we watched it. Fast forward to today, and you have how many ever billions of devices are in the world, um, the vast majority of which are streaming content across the world 24 by 7 in higher resolutions, higher bit depth, higher frame rates, and certainly in new and interesting ways that probably we didn't really think about 20 or 30 years ago, augmented reality, virtu virtual reality. So the, the amount and the type of content has certainly dr drastically changed and continues to, to change. With that comes complexity for the media companies in how they generate and curate and distribute that content. So if you're a large media company, you likely have content creators and editors and distributors all around the world. So how do you easily get data, uh, your, your video files, from where they're created in Europe to your creation team maybe in the U.S. to, you know, distrib and then distributed to a market in Asia, for example. So there's this sense of, of data gravity and how that uh, slows down the distribution of content just internally within a media company. Clearly, the third set of bullets, the way we consume content has drastically changed. Again, it used to be a single television set, and now it's any number of cell phones and tablets and laptops, and it's YouTube, but it's Daily Motion, and it's Facebook. Um, and the pending rollout of 5G will, will further uh, I think, accelerate and increase how much content we watch from what types of devices in what locations. And then last but not least, it certainly changed the way that media and entertainment companies think about their businesses and how they monetize this content. Again, it, it, it used to be, to oversimplify it, that a media company would send us a television program, insert two or three, four commercials every 10 or 15 minutes, and that was their business model. Now we subscribe to Netflix, uh, there are ads embedded within videos or overlaid on top of videos. Uh, the world has certainly changed. So uh, we talk a lot with our customers about the fourth industrial revolution and I think media and entertainment is an in industry that's absolutely being revolutionized uh, in this day and age. Uh, this is just a, a picture that I think illustrates what I mentioned on the previous slide. Right? The, distribution and creation of content used to be pretty simple and now it's just it's much more complex and this is only going to increase over time you know the cloud is really built for the media and entertainment vertical uh, i do a lot of work with aws azure and google that's my role here at scality um, 
and they're all very, very focused on this sector. Uh, why? Uh, as we've touched on, media companies generate lots of data, and they use lots of CPU and GPU cycles for encoding, transcoding, artificial intelligence, metadata creation, content di distribution. So if you look at what AWS, Azure, and Google are doing, they all have dedicated uh, microsites or pages on their websites um, focused on media services. And they've all made um, acquisitions in this space over the last two, three, four years. Uh, and they all have dedicated field level, sales level uh, solutions teams. So the case for cloud media workflows, um, and we'll talk a little more about sort of how we would de define that here in a second. But from a media and entertainment vendor company perspective, the business goals are speed up workflows. So again, how do you get the video file that's created in Vancouver down to your studios in LA, over to your second studio in London, and then distributed to the uh, APAC market? Scale up and down uh, fast based on demand. So when the Olympics are on, media companies are much busier than they are when they're not. Uh, everybody wants to save money. So how, how, are, how can you deal with this exploding amount and variety of content um, without throwing resources, bodies, and infrastructure at it. Um, clearly, they're interested in continuing to improve the customer experience. Um, there are billions of consumers now of video content, and we can easily switch between platforms. Um, so the customer experience, the consumer experience is paramount. Um, as we've touched on, the media landscape has changed drastically over the last couple of decades. It will continue to change as technology advances. And, and clearly, we can't have outages. Right? When, when a television station or a video channel or a website goes down, we as consumers simply go on to the, 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 the next one. So there are some technical requirements here. Um, I think these all follow on very nicely from the business requirements. Um, you need to give your, both your internal uh, employees who are creating and, and working with your content, global access, but then you obviously need to be able to distribute that to a global consumer base as well. Uh, companies are looking to lower costs across every step of the process. So how can you make creation more efficient and quick? How can you process uh, more efficiently? How, how can you distribute at the lowest cost? I think when we get into our panel discussion, we'll, we'll talk about some of these uh, points and how companies are actually lowering costs today. Um, the file sizes are going to continue to expand and the amount of data will continue to grow uh, and companies can't afford to just keep throwing storage at that. Um, we'll see new types of content and target platforms. So the technology platform you have that manages your media and your cloud media workflows needs to uh, adapt, adapt to those new content types. Um, Given what I said about the cloud a couple slides ago, you'll see media and entertainment companies work with many different cloud providers because whether you're Azure with Video Indexer or AWS with Elemental, the cloud providers are leapfrogging each other and continue to add more and more value-added services. And then last but not least, you know, there's traditionally been a pretty big market for media storage in which uh, Scality has always played and, and does very well. Um, but we think there's a new market for media distribution and workflow that needs to integrate with but can't be the same as media storage. Uh, and the way we've architected our solution separates those, but they're, uh, again, very tightly integrated as well. So my last slide, uh, and I invite Giorgio and Paul to sort of jump in and, and help me describe this. When we talk to media and entertainment customers, for us, it's a two-product solution. It, it's Ring, which is our longtime industry-leading product for on-premises storage at scale, and it's Zenko, which is our newer uh, multi-cloud storage agnostic uh, controller, which can take data from Ring and many other on-prem sources and distribute it and manage it across multiple clouds. Obviously, here I've touched on Amazon, Azure, and Google, but we support other services like Wasabi and DigitalOcean. And once your data is there, it's very important, it remains in the native format, in the open format of that cloud provider. 
So if it's in Amazon, it's in Amazon format. If it's in Azure, it's in Azure format, et cetera. Because you want to be able to leverage that data with all of the value added behind the scenes services. Uh, whether it's a Glacier for long-term ar archive or a video indexer from Azure, uh, which does artificial intelligence and metadata, metadata creation. So we have customers and prospects today who are doing this. I think my last point here is that I think what makes our solution unique is twofold. One, um, Ring and Zanko are separate products. So if you're not a Ring customer, you can use Zanko and vice versa. Uh, we do think it's strategically important for people to think about a disconnected and yet integrated solution. And second, as the, the diagram here illustrates, we can actually replicate data to multiple clouds at the same time. A lot of people in this space use the term multi-cloud, and yet they're, they're um, one at a time. Yeah, you can switch between one cloud to another to another, but that's a one-time event. You are, you're either working with Amazon or Azure or Google. It might seem like a nit, but I, I think as you'll hear over the next 10 to 15 minutes, it's a pretty important enabling feature because the cheapest thing you can do with a cloud provider is push data up to a cloud. The most expensive thing you can do with a cloud provider is move data between clouds. Uh, and the way Zanko is architected, we let you do this as, at the most cost-efficient way possible. So I think that's my opening, Giorgio. Paul, anything in this pitch that I missed or that you'd like to add? No, so f thank you very much, Wally. I think it was a it was a great overview. Um, I have a few questions. If uh, if Paul, you don't have uh, any comment at this stage. No, no. Let's go ahead and uh, hit the questions. Happy to participate. Yeah. So a, a few times, Wally, you you talked about uh, using services in the cloud. Uh, and maybe it's a question for Paul as well, but what type of cloud services are media customer interested in? Yeah, maybe uh, I can sure. uh, kind of chime in on that one. Uh, we, we've been talking to customers for a couple of years in this space, and I, I would say that it's changed a bit over time and maybe broadened a bit over time. Uh, a few years ago, the, the request seemed to be, you know, I have all of this media data, and as Wally so well described, it's huge, it's voluminous data. They just wanted a cheaper place to park it, right? They have on-prem storage. The on-prem storage is an asset that they consume. And when they have older older media assets, you want to put them somewhere. So the, the thought of pushing data and just tiering it to Amazon Glacier was something that came up very early on. And of course, there are now archival services in the other clouds and some really, really very attractive low-cost and high-performance cloud storage services like Wasabi. So I think that's one that stayed constant. Um, but now over time, we started hearing about things like, I want to do uh, rendering in the cloud. So I need the compute power that the cloud services have, like EC2, uh, or I want to do uh, content delivery. So there are CDN services in all of these clouds, in the various clouds. And now we start hearing about, um, you know, just other things like specialized services like video indexing and, you know, AI type of services. So. It's certainly broadened, but I think we, we're starting to hear about customers really think about using a collection of these because ultimately these cloud me these workflows for media production are complex on their own, even before you insert cloud, right? And so now with cloud, they have to kind of figure out how to stitch this all together. Yeah, so I, I think Paul's spot on. The only thing I would sort of augment that is when you think about what the hyperscalers, so Amazon, Azure, and Google have been doing over the past 10 to 15 years just with infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, they can do the exact same thing with these value-added services. So Paul mentioned the Azure Video Indexer. So just quickly, you know, it's, a, it's a very interesting, powerful service offered by Azure, obviously, that scans your media files and automatically detects how many people are in which scene, what language is being spoken, is it day, is it night, and it can generate metadata for you that you can then use for uh, ad uh, propagation and analytics. Um, archiving, distribution, things like that. So your average media company just doesn't have the developer resources and the sheer CPU cycles to make a service like that work. Um, and I just think you, you'll see the hyperscalers continue to innovate around the value-added services for the media and entertainment space. Oh, thank you. So you you two really make it clear that they want to use the cloud 
to uh, be active on the data. They just they don't want to use the cloud just to uh, back up or archive. They actually want to process the data. Yeah, that seems to be the net new kind of influence and direction for everybody, right? It used to be about just you know one-time data movement, and now it's much more about active data workflows. You're really inserting the cloud services into the workflow. It's kind of a pipeline from capture to delivery. The services are integral to that. And you need to do that in a very efficient manner, right? Because as we've discussed here, these are some huge assets that we're needing needing to move around. And so when you talk about media, there's always um, a concept of a media asset manager. And so I was uh, wondering how does that play with uh, something like Zenko, especially around the, uh, the metadata? So from my perspective, it's a very good marriage, right? The whole idea of media asset managers is to provide the business intelligence to the end user to catalog things to find things you know you're going to have thousands and millions of assets spread around at least your on-premises systems right but now imagine the idea that you have it not only on premise but in two or three clouds the idea of using uh, you know an intelligent metadata manager like zenko to tag uh, the metadata and to be able to have the application and zenko interplay to do things like intelligent searches seems to be a perfect uh, perfect marriage uh, we've started hearing, for example, about some industry standard media uh, media metadata models, uh, and that's something that can uh, be plugged into Zenko and really uh, sort of enable efficiency on on search and management of the data. Yeah, because today there's no standard for metadata search on object storage, right? Yeah, the only the only thing that we have today is the ability to store the extra metadata through something like the Amazon S3 protocol. But you're right, there's no standard way to search that. Uh, so that's a value added capability that we can provide now in Zenko. You can you know, use system metadata, you can extend it with your own user or application specific metadata, and then perform a very simple search uh, that's sort of global across all of the namespace, uh, independent of where it's stored. Any other questions, Giorgio? What happened? So Wally, maybe another thing we can kind of elaborate while, on while we're waiting for Giorgio is uh, the cost aspects that you described. Uh, I think it's accurate to say that these customers are very, very concerned about data transfer costs. And you sort of yeah. hinted that there was this way that we might be able to optimize that. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, when we first started to work with some of our early Lighthouse customers in the media and entertainment space around Zenko, we found that they were um, moving data to a single cloud, like Amazon, for example, and then moving it out of Amazon to Azure or Google when they saw a second value-added service for them. And um, if, you, if you know much about the way cloud storage pricing costs, is again, it's basically free. Ingress is basically free, but any sort of egress cost, not only cost you network charges, but the cloud providers um, charge you a pretty significant fee. So we worked with these early Lighthouse customers to enable this one-to-many replication. So at a technical level, we actually did extend the S3 CRR API calls so that we can cache data at the Zenko level on-prem and then push it up to multiple clouds at once. And there's all sorts of neat built-in uh, failure detection and retry. Um, so that all works quite well. Um, and then what our customers do is they'll leverage different clouds for different services, and then they'll just delete the data when they're done. And again, deletes are, are essentially free. So this has led to some pretty dramatic cost savings for some of our early Zenko customers. Yeah, and I, I would echo that the other sort of trend that we're starting to see develop is it, it used to be that the standard workflow was to start on-prem um, and then flow the data to the clouds as they're needed. But I think we're even starting to hear kind of the reverse, right? Where maybe the origin of the storage is in the cloud. Is that something you've heard as well? Yeah, um, and that, I found that a bit surprising, but I think it speaks to some, the, the larger media and entertainment companies who have an existing on-premises infrastructure and data center are probably gonna go on-prem to cloud. But some of the smaller ones who may not have that same expansive footprint on-prem will likely start in the cloud 
do much of their work, and then just bring the important summary results back down on-prem. So you think they will uh, still send it on-prem even though it originated from the, somewhere in the cloud? Uh, both Paul and I have heard that recently. Paul, I think you were in a customer meeting just a couple weeks ago where that was their preferred workflow. Yeah, it looked like it was, uh, I've actually seen this at a number of customers, right? So the idea is to use cloud first. It's probably the right place for collection if you have a distributed team, right? If you're doing collaboration with teams across the planet, it makes sense. But what they realize is that long-term storage for near line or online access, it's still gonna be most cost-effective to keep that on-prem, right? And people also have a lot of existing assets on-prem already today in things like NAS systems and you know, there's been a, an increasing use of object storage like the ring. Um, those are very, very good for long, medium to long-term storage from a TCO perspective. So we don't see it going away. It's more about how you stitch it together for efficiency and cost. Yeah. And Giorgio, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, you, know, you, you probably appreciate this as a developer, right? So we have a Zanko user who has a couple of thousand internal developers. Um, and as a developer in, in 2018 going into 2019, you want to develop cloud apps first. I mean, there's clearly development of on-prem apps continuing to, to happen, but um, the cloud offers developers such a, a fast, easy way to create new apps. So I think a lot of the new applications that are being developed by some of these media and entertainment companies are being developed in the cloud, hence their workflows start in the cloud. But then to Paul's point, long-term storage is potentially better on-prem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had another question. Uh, it's around file systems. Uh, when I think about media, uh, I think about a lot of uh, existing storage, existing data uh, that people have on-prem, for example. And it might be into uh, in different type of system. It could be on tape. Uh, it could be on uh, NAS. Or what we see is on multiple generation of different NAS system. So is there a way that um, uh, people could benefit from the cloud uh, and uh, and also enable existing data uh, to be sent uh, to uh, one of the big cloud provider for processing. Yeah, I think you're hitting on a really key point, right? I mean, this is an industry that really helped shape the NAS market, right? Both the traditional kind of scale up NAS market and then they were the ones that had the capacities that sort of demanded the scale out NAS market, right? So there's been a massive investment in this. I mean, customers that we visit will have, in some cases, hundreds of NAS filers. And that, of course, is its own management challenge. But the bigger problem is now, how do you cloudify that storage, right? Because that storage is something, or those files, that data is something that you can repurpose, you can monetize, you probably want to use it in some of the new productions that you're doing. Uh, one of the things that we realize that can be done through Zenko is to discover that data. Right, so we can discover it. We can just uh, basically, you know, assess the file system and not move the data, but to import the metadata into the Zenko namespace. Right, so it's a lighter weight operation. It doesn't incur movement of the heavier assets. But once I have it captured in Zenko, I have the ability to apply policies to it. And some of those policies could be to replicate the data to the cloud, to move it to the cloud. It becomes part of my cloud workflow. Right, and I think that's very powerful for these customers. I think what's really interesting and powerful about that too is it, it's non-disruptive. Um, n nobody likes a, a whole scale lift and shift. And to Paul's point, lots of people have hundreds of filers with a bunch of date, uh, data on them. The solution we're talking about simply um, ingests and creates metadata from your existing data, which can remain in place for as long as you want. But over, over time, you can use it and or migrate it to different platforms. But you can do that on your own schedule. No, that makes sense. There's a, another media, I think, uh, interesting use case we haven't talked about is uh, collaboration between teams. Because most of the time, um, people work on different pieces like subtitles somewhere, somebody else is doing coloring. Uh, does the cloud help into uh, uh, helping on the collaboration workflow? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start and then Wally, help me chime in. You know, so much of the media industry has been focused around how do we move data efficiently between these teams, right? We hear a lot about work groups in California and work groups in New Zealand. 
Uh, China is becoming an influence. Of course, Europe is always going to be in the mix. How do you move the data around? And I think in the past, you've had the emergence of vendors like Aspera and Signiant that have helped us just figure out how to move these big payloads around, right? But ultimately, isn't it better if they're not moved around, right? So I think the cloud provides sort of global view and global access. Uh, but a, a system like Zenko is uh, yet better, right? Because on top of that, it can sort of abstract a global namespace. And that global namespace will not only consist of one or one cloud, it may be multiple clouds. And as we just talked about here, it can also include the on-premises system. So I think from a sharing and collaboration perspective, having a global namespace, there's nothing better than that. Uh, spot on. I, I have nothing to add to that. So I have a question for you, Wally. Um, how is uh, Scality going to partner with uh, cloud providers around vSemini solutions? Well, we've already talked to all the big three hyperscalers and we're in touch with their solutions teams. Um, I had a really interesting discussion a few weeks back with the Azure Video Indexer team. I, I think what you'll see us do over time is integrate some of the value-added services you see on the right-hand side of this slide into the actual Zenko workflows. Um, so then it becomes a very use case and solution driven um, UI. So to, to Paul's last point, maybe if, if you're a content creator or editor in a certain location, you may not necessarily want to know where the file is or you may not know what Zenko is. But what you do want to do is you want to go to a UI and in a couple of clicks, easily select the data that you want no matter where it lives have it be imported into Azure Video in Indexer, have VI do its magic and create all the rich metadata for you, and then have that metadata pulled back into your main on-premise solution where it's most beneficial to your business. So it's that sort of fully integrated end-to-end -end solution that's um, abstracted a bit for the end user in, in, into a nice UI that I think you'll see Scality provide over time. And I think that's a very important point that you're making here, Wally, which is simplicity, right? Because clouds are complex. The use of these cloud services tends to be, you know, API driven and they all have a different dialect, right? So I think one of the core values we're trying to provide here is simplicity. And that starts with kind of a unified approach or a unified method or API for talking to each of the clouds, right? So I think that's been a core focus of what we're, we're doing with Zenko. Yeah, there's the old cliche that with great power comes great responsibility. And I think sometimes with the cloud providers, it's with great power comes great complexity. Uh, and I think that's the challenge that uh, Zenko aims to solve. I have one last question before I think we are going to uh, be at the uh, 30 minutes mark. So uh, how can a major customer save money with the cloud? So we touched on that a bit a few minutes ago um, with the one-to-many one replication. Um, so again, I think there's a very simple low-hanging fruit way uh, that our Zenko customers are saving money right out of the gate by reducing their uh, egress costs and their data movement costs. I think their further savings, um, and this speaks a little bit to what Paul was talking about a few minutes ago, about more efficient data workflows. So if you're actually moving less data around the world overall because you have a global namespace, that will certainly save you network costs, even if it's internal data movement from your origin server in the U.S. to, for example, an origin server in, in Europe. Um, so you'll save money and just on the transfer costs across your network, but you'll also make your workers more efficient, which is a slightly softer cost. Um, but as I mentioned on one of the earlier slides, content is being created so quickly and needs to get pushed out to consumers so quickly that anything these media and entertainment companies can do to become more efficient and faster in their workflows will save them money slash increase their revenue. Yeah, and I think that's a great answer, Wally. And I think one other one we hear occasionally is, I just want to have a second copy of my data, right? Sometimes it's for business continuity reasons or disaster recovery reasons. I think what we hear is that people want to uh, have that second copy in something very cost effective. They're starting to look at uh, archival services in the cloud and even purpose-built low-cost services that we mentioned Wasabi earlier. 
it's a fantastic answer for storing the data at a very uh, cost-effective uh, manner. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly give a shout out to Wasabi. If, if you're a, a listener looking for a second copy at a pretty efficient price, but high performance, uh, visit Wasabi for sure. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are reaching the, uh, the end of our discussion. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Wally. Thank you for everybody who joined and uh, Stefano for helping set up uh, this meeting. I think we'll do over uh, webinars like this, uh, where we will uh, be interviewing and asking questions to kind of zoom on uh, on this one. Um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, we're going to be at uh, AWS uh, reInvent, and that uh, you will find us there and uh, something we can talk about. And on this note, this will end up as a blog post on our website, and you will be able to replay the video. And that's it for today. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.